In the spring of 1769, Letizia and Carlo Bonaparte were crossing the mountains that straddled the interior of the island of Corsica. They were Corsican patriots, determined to repel a French army that had invaded their tiny island nation. The Corsicans were only about 100 to 120,000 people of peasant or shepherd origin. They had very few firearms, very little gunpowder, and that was all. They had to defend themselves against the 22 million population of France, then the most advanced country in Europe. The Corsicans never stood a chance. After a year of fighting, leaving thousands dead and wounded, they were defeated, and Letizia and Carlo were going home. Letizia was six months pregnant. That summer, Letizia was celebrating the Feast of the Assumption when she felt her first labor pain. Later that day, August 15, 1769, she gave birth to a son, Napoleone, Napoleone Bonaparte. Born just after the bitter French conquest, Napoleon would spend his childhood hating France, the nation he would one day rule. I was born when Corsica was perishing, Napoleon later wrote. 30,000 Frenchmen spewed onto our shores, drowning the throne of liberty in waves of blood. The cries of the dying, the groans of the oppressed, and tears of despair surrounded my cradle from the hour of my birth. Corsica was now a French colony suspended in the mediterranean between france and italy for centuries corsicans had fiercely resisted invaders romans moors genoese after the french victory corsican rebels fled to the mountains where they continued to fight on but napoleon's father carlo a 23 year old university student readily submitted soon he was wearing powdered wigs embroidered waistcoats and silver-buckled shoes. Napoleon never forgave him for betraying his Corsican heritage. He would later say harshly that his father was rather too fond of pleasure. I think Napoleon always held a grudge against his father for having submitted. But poor Carlo, he knew he had lost the battle. He realized the French were there, so he had to live with them and make the best of it. Carlo began practicing law, won election to the Corsican assembly, and rose in the esteem of the French rulers. But Napoleon rarely had a good thing to say about him. He saved his praise for his mother. The beautiful, strong-willed Letizia. As a mother, he would say, she was without equal. He was obsessed by her, fascinated by her, praised her enormously. She was a very tough and determined little woman. Thirteen times pregnant, she had eight surviving children. He says that all his success in life was due to the training she gave him. La mère. The mother. What a man, Napoleon said. She has the head of a man on the body of a woman. Carlo and Letizia owned a house in the country as well as one in the city, a mark of their status. They were Corsican aristocrats, but they were not rich. With eight children, they struggled just to get by on an island that had been impoverished for centuries. There was nothing the ambitious couple believed that Corsica could offer them or their children. Only one country could, the country that had vanquished their own, 
France. As a representative of the Corsican parliament, Carlo traveled to Versailles. There he saw the splendor of the French court in all its majesty. France was the envy of Europe. Great Britain, Austria, Prussia, Spain, none had more people or greater wealth. While America was just beginning its experiment with democracy, Versailles gave testimony to the power of kings. Carlo was an awestruck provincial. Rumblings of discontent with King Louis XVI and aristocratic privilege were no concern of his. That Queen Marie Antoinette and a frivolous court were draining France of precious resources did nothing to diminish Carlo's delight in everything he saw. He dreamed that one day his children would become noblemen in that glittering citadel of power in which he had no place. For years, Carlo had nourished a plan. In Versailles, he saw it come true. He secured Napoleon a scholarship to a school in France. Napoleon set foot in France for the first time in the winter of 1778 a thin, sallow nine-year-old, accustomed to the warmth of the Mediterranean, suddenly alone on the windswept plains of northern France. A scholarship boy at the Royal Military College at Brienne-le-Chateau. He could hardly speak French. For the next five years, there would be no holidays, no visits home. He had no love of France. He still thought of himself as a grudging subject of an alien king. He thinks of himself as a Corsican. He is surrounded by students who are the children of French aristocrats. And they have nothing in common with this little foreigner. And since he is quite proud, he becomes a loner. Napoleon would one day turn his sympathies toward France, but not without years of resentment and struggle. He was 15 when he was promoted to the Royal Military Academy in Paris. Along with the sons of some of France's greatest families, he would learn the splendors of French civilization. The Royal Academy was as much a finishing school, turning officers into gentlemen as a war college. We were magnificently fed and served, Bonaparte said, treated in every way like officers possessed of great wealth. The poor Corsican teenager still felt like an outsider. He had entered a world of opulence and luxury, but it only served to fuel his scorn for the privilege and snobbery of the French nobility. One teacher described him as quiet and solitary, frightfully egotistical, proud, ambitious, aspiring to everything. He would go far, his school report read, in favorable circumstances. He began his apprenticeship as a soldier when he was 16, a lowly second lieutenant, training with the best artillery unit in the French Army. He grew expert at sighting a gun, handling rammer and shot, deploying men. One of the greatest careers in military history had begun. He feels that the regime will not let him have the position he dreams of. The top positions are reserved for the noblemen. While Napoleon comes from minor nobility, poor people. Frustrated in his military ambitions, Bonaparte dreamed of becoming famous as an author. 
wrote a brief history of Corsica, even tried his hand at a novel. He knows that he's capable of great things. He feels that perhaps he's destined for greatness. But at that point, how can he possibly believe it? He's bored to death. Always alone among men, Bonaparte wrote, I come home to dream by myself and to give myself over to all the forces of my melancholy. My thoughts dwell on death. What fury drives me to wish for my own destruction? No doubt because I see no place for myself in this world. It was the revolution that would set Bonaparte free. On July 14, 1789, Paris erupted. Angry crowds stormed through the streets, crying liberty, equality, brotherhood. France was thrown into turmoil. The monarchy itself tottered on the edge of destruction. A defiant National Assembly challenged the absolute right of the king, stripped nobles and clergy of their ancient feudal privileges, fracturing a social order that had endured for centuries. After years of injustice and inequality, the revolution had begun. It would take years before it would end. As the revolution gained momentum, Bonaparte was serving in the army far from Paris. He distrusted the violent mobs, but welcomed the changes transforming the country. He is certainly not a revolutionary before the beginning of the revolution. But Bonaparte welcomes the revolution as good news. It almost has a religious impact for him. Because all of a sudden he feels that the revolution is going to open up French society. La révolution va ouvrir la société française. L'abolition des privileges, le fait que la société française ne va plus connaître une hiérarchie, privileges, put an end to hierarchies and the kind of condescension from which Napoleon had suffered while he was growing up. Napoleon dans sa jeunesse. Bonaparte was a man of his times, and to be 20 years old in 1789 is very important. Napoleon's destiny and the destiny of the whole country become the same. In the summer of 1792, Bonaparte was on leave in Paris witnessed the last gasp of the French monarchy. In June, a mob stormed the Tuileries Palace and forced the king to wear the red revolutionary bonnet. In August, the mob massacred the king's Swiss guard. King Louis XVI was dethroned. Napoleon wants to be part of this new world. He wants to play a role. And he starts in a place he knows very well. He starts with Corsica. Bonaparte was 23, an idealistic revolutionary, when he took leave of absence from the French army and returned to Corsica. The French Republic had made Corsica a part of France, and given Corsicans all the rights and liberties of French citizens. Bonaparte, a lieutenant in the island's National Guard, threw himself into Corsican politics. 
Pasquale Paoli was the island's governor. Paoli had been Bonaparte's childhood hero, the leader of the Corsican War against France. Now Bonaparte dreamed of rising to power, standing by Paoli's side. But he would be bitterly disappointed. Paoli did not trust him. A ragazzoni inesperto, Paoli called him. A big, inexperienced boy. The Corsican patriot thought Bonaparte too ambitious, too self-centered, too sympathetic to France. Bonaparte and Paoli are on totally different wavelengths. Paoli retains the idea that Corsica should be independent. By this time, Napoleon Bonaparte uh, is, is, is perfectly uh, comfortable with a, a Corsica that is part of revolutionary France. Bonaparte soon became the leader of a faction opposed to Paoli. Clan rivalry ran deep on the island, intensifying the political struggle between the two men. Paoli's partisans and Bonaparte's were soon at war. In the end, Paoli proved too strong. Bonaparte's home was sacked and he was forced to flee to the mountains. The Corsican assembly declared Bonaparte and his entire family traitors and enemies of the fatherland, condemned to perpetual execration and infamy. Bonaparte no longer had the right to live in Corsica. He had been given a death sentence by his own people. His idealism shaken, Bonaparte wrote his brother, among so many conflicting ideas, the honest man is confused and distressed. Since one must take sides, one might as well choose the side which is victorious. Considering the alternative, it is better to eat than be eaten. The defeat in Corsica, the break with his hero Pauli, had toughened him, made him shrewd, and turned him toward France. From the time when there is this breakup with Paoli's Corsica, he is French. He wants to be French. He is French. On June 10th, 1793, he set sail for France with his widowed mother, three brothers, and three sisters. A refugee family, carrying with them all they owned in the world. 24 years old, he was banished from the land of his birth forever. Bonaparte returned to France to find the French fighting among themselves. The king had been executed. The queen and thousands more followed him to the guillotine. There were cities in revolt, uprisings in the provinces. Maximilien Robespierre was in charge now. The austere, moralizing leader suspended the Constitution, vowing to save the Republic from its enemies at any cost. The revolution turned into the terror. Torn by civil war, France was also at war with almost all of Europe. Austria, Spain, Prussia, and Great Britain were bent on destroying the new French Republic, while French radicals promised to help all peoples rise against their rulers. Reinstated in the army as an artillery captain, Bonaparte was ordered to Toulon, a city of 28,000 on the southern coast that had rebelled against the Republic, throwing its port open to the English. The British fleet defended the city from the harbor, 24-year-old Bonaparte thought he knew how to drive them out. He argued that if his soldiers could seize the heights commanding the harbor, they could bombard the fleet, drive it away, and the city would fall. It was a simple plan, but none of the generals would listen. The generals in Toulon were 
total incompetence, or a little worse. Finally, a fairly competent general showed up, listened to Napoleon's plans, and said, naturally. This would be Bonaparte's first great chance. With the aristocratic officers fleeing the country, there was suddenly a vacuum, an opportunity for rapid promotion for soldiers who could prove themselves under fire. Bonaparte fought bravely, leading his men in the assault on the fort guarding the heights, suffering a wound in the thigh from an enemy bayonet. Ten ships went up in flames. The British fled. Toulon was recaptured and Bonaparte promoted. In just three months, he had risen from captain to brigadier general. The Republic continued to fight for its life, still clashing with enemies beyond its borders, still in turmoil at home. With France in chaos, threatened on all sides, Robespierre showed no mercy in his efforts to bring about unity and order. Liberty, he said, cannot be secured unless criminals lose their heads. Determined to make his voice heard, Bonaparte wrote a political tract in support of Robespierre. The young soldier hated the terror, but he hated chaos even more. Bonaparte is really a man of order. For him, order has to serve ideals, exactly the idea of Robespierre. It is necessary to suspend liberties in the name of liberty. In order to save liberty, to save the Republic, it's necessary to suspend individual liberties. In the summer of 1794, Robespierre's government fell. Now it was the turn of those who made the terror to die, including Robespierre. In the spring of 1795, Bonaparte headed for Paris. Now a brigadier general, he was determined to rise still higher. France had a new constitutional government. The guillotine, the riots in the street, the war still raging along the frontier, all seemed forgotten. Bonaparte frequented the salons where the women who dominated Paris society held court. The women here, he wrote his brother, are the center of importance. Here, alone of all places on earth, they appear to hold the reins of government. But they wanted little to do with him. He was just another ambitious young soldier. I can still picture him, one noble woman remembered. He wore badly made dirty boots and a nasty round hat pulled down over his eyes. An overall sickly effect was created by this thinness and his yellow complexion. Bonaparte seemed to have come to a dead end. He was desperate for promotion, but no one paid any attention. If this continues, he wrote his brother, I shall end by not stepping aside when a carriage rushes past. Then political turmoil once again gave him his chance. On October 5th, 1795, crowds of Parisians stormed through the streets alongside National Guardsmen bent on restoring the monarchy. The rebellion threatened to topple the Republic. The government called on Bonaparte to repel the attack. There wasn't much other choice, actually, when this rebellion broke. 
there aren't any competent generals in Paris. Here's young Bonaparte. He's a man of uh, conviction. Uh, put him in. Napoleon was not one to push his butt around. He would use all his weapons. Nobody had really used cannon on the Paris mobs before. He was going to shoot. He waited till they could see the whites of their eyes. The enemy attacked us, Bonaparte wrote his brother. We killed a great many of them. Now all is quiet. I could not be happier. Three weeks later, he was made a full general, commander of the Army of the Interior. He was 26. Bonaparte was now a man to be reckoned with. He was driving through Paris in a fine carriage, wearing new clothes, drenching himself in eau de cologne. The unsophisticated general was no ladies' man, but he had fallen in love. Her name was Marie Joseph Rose de Beauharnais. Everyone called her Rose. Bonaparte called her Josephine. She was a Creole aristocrat from the French colony of Martinique, a 32-year-old widow with two small children, deep in debt, trying to make her way in Paris alone. Languid, with a nonchalant shading into indolence, she was known as a woman of refinement, charm, and grace. It was said that she even went to bed gracefully. Bonaparte was dazzled by her, I was naturally timid among women, he said. Madame de Beauharnais was the first woman who gave me any degree of confidence. Josephine was what might be called a slightly fast woman. She'd been married young, her husband had died in the guillotine. She'd had an affair with somebody that helped her out. And it was well known she had affairs with men in high French society. No one stood higher than Paul Barat, the most powerful figure in the new government. Josephine was his mistress, a woman of influence in the most fashionable salons in Paris. Bonaparte saw her in a world of power. She was at the center of society. She had all these connections. She was very much someone who could be useful to him. And then I think he just fell madly in love with her. Josephine lived in a little cottage set in a pleasant garden. Some said it was Barat who paid the rent. But Barat was growing tired of her. Now Bonaparte visited her there. Josephine seemed amused by her new lover. Although she knew how to please him, she did not return his passion. When Bonaparte proposed marriage, she hesitated. She wasn't attracted to him at all. In fact, she told a friend later that she, for a long time she had to overcome a feeling of repugnance. He was so serious and he had no sense of humor. He was skinny. His hair was kind of hanging and he was unkempt. But she knows her beauty is vanishing. Already her teeth are bad, she's getting wrinkles. Napoleon doesn't see it, but others see it, and she sees it. Her looks fading and her debts mounting, she needed a protector. On March 9, 1796, Napoleon Bonaparte and Josephine de Beauharnais were married. A gold enameled medallion was the general's wedding gift to his bride. On it were inscribed the words, 
to destiny. Bonaparte was sent to the Italian Alps. Josephine's former lover, Paul Barat, had helped win him an appointment as supreme commander of all French forces in Italy. His assignment was to challenge the Empire of Austria and their Italian allies. He had never commanded an army before. Young and untested, no one expected very much from him, especially his own generals. Tout le monde l'attend avec un peu de moquerie. Everyone makes fun of him before he gets there. This little general who perhaps owes his command to his wife. Then he arrives. And within a few moments, the veterans who made fun of him understand exactly. He is in charge. I don't know why, one of his generals said, but the little bastard scares me. Bonaparte's army was in no condition to win battles. It had been stagnating under incompetent commanders in the foothills of the Alps for almost two years. Soldiers, he proclaimed, you are naked and ill-fed. No fame shines upon you. I will lead you into the most fertile plains in the world. Rich provinces, great cities will lie in your power. You will find there honor, glory, and riches. He really enthralls them. He's a terrific actor. He is capable of laughing, smiling. And then suddenly he is passionate, inspiring fear, horror, and anger. On April 2, 1796, Bonaparte led his army forward. He was badly outnumbered. 38,000 French soldiers faced 38,000 Austrians and their allies, 25,000 Piedmontese. Bonaparte planned to isolate the Austrians from the Piedmontese, then conquer each separately. He would strike first at Piedmont. In just two weeks, he won six battles, took thousands of prisoners, and broke the back of Piedmont's army. One Piedmontese officer would later complain, they sent a young madman who attacks right, left, and from the rear. It's an intolerable way of making war. On April 26th, Piedmont surrendered. Bonaparte demanded gold and silver and paid his troops, the first real money they had seen in years. Soldiers, he said, we thank you. While Bonaparte led his soldiers into battle, he never stopped thinking of Josephine, writing her letter after letter, day after day. Not a day goes by without my loving you, he wrote her. Not a night without holding you in my arms. I curse the glory and ambition which keeps me from the soul of my life. Whenever I am troubled as to how things will turn out, I put my hand to my heart where throbs your likeness. I have but to look at it, and my love is perfect happiness. Josephine would sometimes read his letters aloud to friends. Bonaparte, she told them, is so amusing. With Piedmont defeated, Bonaparte was now pursuing the Austrians, who retreated to the east, bewildered, by the 26-year-old general and his new way of making war. In the 18th century, there were nobles commanding on both sides and they had a, a certain code. The armies would maneuver and very often if one had the other in check, that would be the end of it. There would be no fight. Napoleon was in a way the first modern general. He did not accommodate those old codgers on the other side uh, at all. 
Il attaque tous les jours. He attacks every day. He attacks when it snows, he attacks at night, he attacks when it's cold. It's not the way the game is played. Il cherche l'ennemi. He looks for the enemy, fights it, and when they assume that he's going to stop, he continues. The next day, he fights again. It surprises them. Et il surprend. As the Austrians fled, their rear guard hoped to slow Bonaparte down by making a stand at the little Italian town of Lodi. They fortified a narrow wooden bridge with 14 cannon and three battalions and dared Bonaparte to cross it. The general ordered a simple frontal assault on the bridge. Everything would depend on the courage of his men. He had earned their admiration with his rapid string of victories. Now he would find out if he also had their faith. How do you incite men to do something like that? It's charisma. I mean, it got tremendous presence. Napoleon was a master at motivating his soldiers. Victory always goes a long way. The more they win, the harder they get to stop. His troops were pretty well hepped up. They'd been chasing Austrians now for weeks, and uh, they went forward. There are no tactics at all. The troops come in so enthusiastically and quickly, it surprises the enemy. It's just a question of enthusiasm. Everyone throws themselves into it. Everyone risks death. With his men facing withering enemy fire, Bonaparte was in the thick of it. He was actually up there laying in the cannon, which was a corporal's job. But he was always up there with them. This is a man with absolute courage. He's wherever he's needed. If he's needed up at the very front to encourage people, he's there. He takes physical risks. Even if cannonballs fall close to him, and this happened on several occasions, he's not afraid. The French made it halfway across the bridge and fell back under a vicious hail of fire. Then, one last charge and they were across. The Austrian guns fell silent. Here they thought they were safe behind the river, holding the bridge, you know, once the French come across the bridge and beat the living Jesus out of them. It's a real spectacular job. It wasn't a big battle, the casualties were not particularly heavy, but he had imposed his will on his own men and the enemy, both. It was not a great victory. The Austrian army had in fact escaped. But Bonaparte had won the respect and devotion of his men. He came out all sweaty and grimy and covered with gun smoke. The troops liked that. They began calling him the little corporal right there. It was, you identify with us, you're, you're, you're our corporal. This is the moment when he becomes convinced that he has a lucky star and that destiny has chosen him to accomplish great things. They haven't seen anything yet, Bonaparte told one of his generals. In our time, no one has the slightest conception of what is great. 
it is up to me to give them an example. There was a spark. The battle at Lodi convinced Napoleon Bonaparte that he was a man of destiny. From that moment, he said, I foresaw what I might be. Already I felt the earth flee from beneath me, as if I were being carried into the sky. Bonaparte led his victorious armies into Milan. He was greeted by the Milanese as a heroic liberator, the general who freed them from their Austrian rulers. We come to break your chains, Bonaparte proclaimed. Our only quarrel is with the tyrants who have enslaved you. He was more than a general now. He had made himself the head of a provisional Italian government. With an exalted sense of his own destiny, he was determined to follow his star to the heights of power. Great men become great because they have been able to master luck, Bonaparte said. What the vulgar call luck is a characteristic of genius. I shall be frantic if I do not have a letter from you tonight, Bonaparte wrote Josephine. Bonaparte desperately wanted his wife to join him in Italy, but Josephine refused to leave Paris. She was spending her time with a dapper young army lieutenant. Elle trompe Napoléon. She's cheating on Napoleon with a young officer, infinitely more seductive than Napoleon. Elle n'est pas à l'époque. She's not in love with Napoleon. She's afraid she'll be bored in Italy, because in Paris it's a life of parties, a life of luxury. Finally, after weeks of Bonaparte's pleading letters, Josephine left Paris for Italy. She wept, wrote one witness, as though she were going to a torture chamber. She arrived at Milan's Serbaloni Palace to find that her husband had filled it with flowers in her honor. There they spent the third night of their married life together. After 48 hours, Bonaparte went back to doing what he did best, making war. The Austrian army with fresh reinforcements was still a threat. Now, Bonaparte dealt them a series of crushing blows. Finishing them off in January 1797 in a three-day battle at Rivoli, 60 miles west of Venice. His victories in Italy began the legend of his invincibility, immortalized in a series of romantic paintings. Bonaparte was not only a warrior, he was also a shrewd propagandist. From his first triumphs, Bonaparte understood that it's not enough to win victories. He uses images to make sure that his victories in Italy are widely publicized in France. He understood that art is also a means of propaganda. He orders a painting after a victory. He dictates the theme. 
il leur donne the layout of the characters des personnages il va même jusqu'à imposer he even orders the dimensions of the frame napoleon d'emblée from the very beginning napoleon gave himself an image il a d'emblée arrangé he created his own history il crée une presse he created his own newspapers la france and the army of italy and the newspaper of the army of italy which exalt his victories bonaparte lui-même qui rédige bonaparte himself actually wrote some articles he himself wrote bonaparte flies like lightning and strikes like a thunderbolt bonaparte vole comme l'éclair et frappe comme la foudre While Bonaparte's fame grew in France, he was wearing out his welcome in Italy. When he met armed resistance, he ordered towns sacked, villages burned, rebels shot. Many Italians now began doubting the general, who said he fought in the name of liberty, but was sending convoys of gold and silver back to his government in France, along with some of the great treasures of Italian art. Works by Michelangelo, Titian, Raphael, the four ancient bronze horses from St. Mark's Basilica in Venice. All would soon find a home in a new museum in Paris that would one day be called the Louvre. While he ruled in Italy, Bonaparte never stopped chasing Austrians. Just two months after his victory at Rivoli, he had driven them from northern Italy crossed the Alps into Austria itself, and by April 7, 1797, was within 75 miles of Vienna. Stunned by the advancing French armies, the Austrian emperor sued for peace. This is what will happen to your empire, he shouted. Your empire is nothing but an old maidservant, accustomed to being raped by everyone. Bonaparte, the Austrian delegation reported to Vienna, had behaved like a madman. There are a lot of legends about this. Napoleon was a man choleric. Napoleon was hot-tempered, sometimes with violent physical reactions. And when the negotiations dragged on too long, Napoleon became agitated, started pacing back and forth, smacked into a small table, and overturned a tea service. Whether by rage, insult, or shrewd diplomacy, Bonaparte got what he wanted and he had dictated the terms of the treaty himself, without instructions from the government in Paris. He saw that his intelligence, his abilities, were more than just military. He had become not only a great general, but also possibly a future statesman, and everybody realizes it, not only in Italy, but in France. At the end of 1797, 28-year-old Napoleon Bonaparte returned to Paris and handed the government a treaty which brought a fragile peace to the continent of Europe. Now only Great Britain remained at war with France. In just one and a half years, he had taken his dispirited, tattered soldiers, marched them hundreds of miles, and defeated the army of the Empire of Austria without ever losing a battle.
The French were hungry for a hero, someone who could put an end to the political chaos into which the revolution had descended. One government after another had come and gone. Now they lived under a new one, the Directory. The Directory was an unstable, fragile parliamentary government that commanded no confidence. All of France turned toward Bonaparte, wondering what he would do next. What I have done up to now is nothing, he said privately. I am only at the beginning of the course I must run. I can no longer obey. I have tasted command, and I cannot give it up. While Bonaparte waited for the right moment to seize power, he set his sights on new glories in the exotic East. He eluded a British fleet, and on July 1st, 1798, landed with 35,000 soldiers in Egypt. France was still at war with Great Britain, and Bonaparte hoped to disrupt British trade routes to India. In 1798, Egypt was still a source of wonder to most Europeans. The souks crowded with Turks and Jews, Syrians and Greeks. The minarets sounding the call of an alien religion. The Sphinx, with its broken nose, buried in the sand up to its neck. Bonaparte finds himself in a country of legends, myths, and a great history. But it was really madness on his part, because all of the military calculations at the time held that it was impossible for a European army to conquer the East. Bonaparte quickly captured Alexandria. And then on July 3rd, led his soldiers across the desert toward Cairo and a looming battle. For centuries, the Egyptians had been part of the Turkish Empire, ruled by the fiercest warriors in the Middle East, the Mamelukes. Remarkable for their courage, pride, and cruelty, the Mamelukes waited fearlessly for the French armies. One Mameluk prince called them donkey boys. The Mamelukes charged a cannon with their sabers and their horses, with arms from the Middle Ages. It was a meeting between the Europe of the future and the Egypt of the past. Napoleon just organized his army into five gigantic squares. These are men kneeling and standing and firing. So you've got a continual rolling fire. The uh, Mamelukes rode around the squares and were shot at by that square and by this square. The French lost 30 men. The Mamelukes lost uh, probably five or 6,000. The Battle of the Pyramids was over in an hour. Three days later, Bonaparte led his army into Cairo. I was full of dreams, he said. I saw myself founding a new religion, marching into Asia riding an elephant, a turban on my head, and in my hand, the new Koran. But Bonaparte's dreams of empire were quickly shattered. The British Admiral Horatio Nelson caught the French fleet anchored off the Egyptian coast and blew it to pieces. Bonaparte and 35,000 soldiers were trapped in Egypt. The only link that he had with France were his ships his fleet of warships. You can imagine what a disaster this was. 
He was forced to stay in Egypt and live with the Egyptians, to find his bread and water in Egypt, and even find ammunition for his weapons in Egypt, to live in Egypt. While Bonaparte was marooned in Egypt, his wife was buying a new home. A manor house six miles from Paris called Malmaison. There, Josephine enjoyed over 300 acres of gardens, woods, and fields and the companionship of her lover. When an aide dared to tell Bonaparte the truth, the general was crushed. The veil is torn, he wrote his brother. I am tired of grandeur. All my feelings have dried up. I no longer care about my glory. At 29, I have exhausted everything. Furious, he took the wife of one of his officers for a mistress. His friends called her the General's Cleopatra. Cut off from France, Bonaparte remained undaunted. Installed in a palace, in Cairo, he imagined himself an Eastern potentate, following in the footsteps of Alexander the Great. He came to Egypt at the head of an army, and suddenly he found himself at the head of a nation. And it's not just any nation, it's Egypt. Egypt was an enigma to Europeans. Bonaparte saw a chance to be the first to unravel its mysteries. Along with his army, he had brought with him a remarkable group of mathematicians, artists, map makers, and engineers. They set about producing a monumental document, a description of Egypt, 24 volumes of text and pictures. They studied the crocodile and the ibis, music and mummies, surveyed temples and tombs, and measured the dimensions of the Sphinx. One scientist found a new species of blue water lily, another an unknown Nile fish. The most dramatic discovery of all was a big black stone with some puzzling inscriptions. The Rosetta Stone would prove to be the key to deciphering Egyptian hieroglyphics. The monumental volumes that were published by the scientists that went along with Napoleon to Egypt laid the foundation for this study of Egyptology today. The true conquests Bonaparte wrote, the only ones that leave no regret, are those that have been wrested from ignorance. In February 1799, Bonaparte took 13,000 soldiers into Syria. The Sultan of Turkey had declared war on the French infidels, and Bonaparte went on the offensive. After a quick victory at Jaffa, he assaulted Accra, where he was forced to lay siege to the well-fortified city. Attack after attack failed claiming the lives of hundreds of French soldiers. Hundreds more were struck down by the bubonic plague. Bonaparte abandoned the siege and retreated to Cairo with a dispirited army of sick and wounded men. But Bonaparte refused to admit the extent of the disaster. I am returning to Cairo with many prisoners and flags, he proclaimed. I raised the ramparts of Accra. There is not a stone left standing. On 
On August 23, 1799, Bonaparte secretly set sail for home, abandoning more than 30,000 soldiers with little more than an apologetic message. Extraordinary circumstances alone have persuaded me to pass through enemy lines and return to Europe. France was once again at war with Austria, Britain, and Russia. Civil war continued to tear the country apart. The government in Paris was in disarray. Already, there were rumors of an impending coup. Bonaparte dreamed of rescuing France, but feared he had not moved fast enough. All great events hang by a hair, he told an aide. I believe in luck, but the wise man neglects nothing which helps his destiny. On October 9, 1799, he landed in France and found himself greeted by cheering crowds. The campaign in Egypt, a military disaster, had been a propaganda triumph. In the theaters, what's being shown? The expedition to Egypt, the victory of the pyramids. When he arrives, he's considered the man of the hour. His genius was to come to France and say, you need a savior, here I am. The French people believed that Napoleon was destined to do great things. In all the engravings of the period, you see the two frigates which brought Napoleon from Egypt. And above the first frigate, a star. By October 16th, Bonaparte was in Paris. First, he would settle with Josephine. With his steady rise to fame and power, the dynamic between the inexperienced soldier and the sophisticated society woman had shifted. Bonaparte was determined to divorce his wife. He returned home, locked himself in his room, and refused even to see her. I will never forgive her, he said. Never. But Josephine was just as determined to win him back. She climbed the stairs to his room and begged him to let her in. Bonaparte puts his fists in his ears. He refuses to hear her, and she bangs on the door and cries, I have loved only you. But Bonaparte kept saying, no, no, no. Napoleon, a force Napoleon is forced to hear his wife crying, begging, swearing that she will never do it again, promising that she will never do it again, but just open the door. By the time the sun rose, Bonaparte had weakened. The next morning found husband and wife in each other's arms. Josephine would never take a lover again. And while Bonaparte would always insist that he loved her best, he would do as he pleased with other women. Back in France, less than a week, Bonaparte saw that the time had come to act. Solemnly deliberating in the Luxembourg Palace, the Directory was about to be swept aside. The debt from eight long years of war was mounting. Draft evasion, rampant. Bandits roamed the highways in the countryside. The government seemed powerless. Already, there were schemes to overthrow it. As the crisis ripened, Bonaparte determined to find a way to seize power for himself. His moment, he knew, had arrived. He allied himself with one of the plotters, a member of the directory, Emmanuel Siez who needed the support of the popular young general. This coup that Siez plans is a parliamentary coup, a political coup. 
Siez is in charge, and force will only be used if something goes wrong. General Bonaparte is only supposed to have a supporting role in this coup. On November 9, 1799, Bonaparte and Siez set their plot in motion. It's really a very simple premise, that the parliament will put itself out of business, they will vote in a provisional government that will, in effect, start over again, draft a new constitution. They expect that the bayonets will never be unsheathed and a shot uh, will never be fired. For the coup to have an air of legitimacy, Bonaparte and Siez wanted the legislators to vote them into power. They didn't want to seize it. Bonaparte counted on the help of his brother Lucien, who had been elected president of the lower house of the legislature as a result of his brother's popularity. But Lucien was powerless to persuade the council to dissolve the government. They run into real opposition. The opposition insist uh, that every deputy renew his oath of allegiance to the existing constitution, which they do. It takes over two hours to do this. Meanwhile, the key plotters waiting outside in the wings, as it were, are getting very uh, agitated, and particularly General Bonaparte, who eventually just loses patience and decides that he must intervene to speed things up. He enters the legislative house. This is strictly against the law. The legislature is barred to uh, any uh, outside military figure. And what he encounters there is, is genuine rage. The members of the assembly, they, they see these bayonets and the bearskin hats marching down the main aisle with Bonaparte in between them. And they begin to shout and scream, outlaw him, outlaw him. He's trying to take over the government. And his brother, Lucien, said, wait a minute, my brother's not trying to take over the government. Calm down. And they say, we want him outlawed, we want him outlawed. Bonaparte never gets to utter a word uh, to, the, to the deputies. Uh, and he is, in effect, hustled out by the grenadiers who had come in with him. Uh, and uh, is quite badly shaken by this. Bonaparte had bungled. The coup seemed lost. His chance for power finished. When some of his own soldiers began to doubt their general's intentions, his brother Lucien took control of the chaotic situation. Lucien sees that Napoleon is going to miss the moment. He has the drums beat. He draws his sword. He walks over to Napoleon. He presses the, the point of the, of the sword, Napoleon's chest, and he said, believe me, soldiers of France, if Napoleon aspired to take over the government, be dictator, I'd run him through. The soldiers stormed the assembly hall. The cowed legislators fled, some jumping unceremoniously out the windows. At two o'clock that morning, a small rump of the council in league with the plotters reassembled and voted into law a new provisional government with three provisional consuls at its head. Bonaparte was one of them. This triumvirate is only a facade. The parliamentary coup had become a military coup. And a strong man is no longer Siez, now it is Bonaparte. Within weeks, Bonaparte outmaneuvered the other consuls, rewrote the constitution, and made himself head of state under the title First Consul. As the year 1800 began, Napoleon Bonaparte, 30 years old, was the most powerful man in France. The revolution, Bonaparte said, is over. And then he added, I am the revolution.
War had catapulted Bonaparte into power. Now, war would help him secure it. France was still fighting Great Britain and Austria. Bonaparte conceived a daring plan to catch the Austrians by surprise. In the spring of 1800, he took his soldiers over the Alps. 40,000 men, field artillery, trekking across... treacherous layers of snow and ice through the great St. Bernard Pass. Not since the Carthaginian general Hannibal had an army attempted such an outlandish offensive. It's 10,500 feet high. They dragged their guns in pine trees, they hauled it out like canoes, and they took off across the mountains. On May 20th, Bonaparte made the crossing himself. Jacques-Louis David memorialized the adventure in his heroic portrait of Napoleon mounted on a gleaming stallion. In fact, Bonaparte crossed the Alps riding a sure-footed mule. It took the general and his army just six days. On the morning of June 14th, he faced the Austrians at Marengo, 45 miles from Milan. By the end of the day, there were 6,000 French casualties, but nearly twice as many Austrians had been killed or wounded. The French had won. My power depends on my glory, Bonaparte said, and my glory on my victories. Early the next year, the Emperor of Austria ordered a halt to the fighting and signed a treaty with France. Great Britain followed the year after. For the first time in 10 years, all of Europe was at peace. Bonaparte had been in power just six months, and the people of France had seen other political regimes which had lasted only a year. They said, well, Bonaparte might not last either. After Marengo, things changed. Ordinary people, as well as people in the ruling class, now thought Bonaparte would last. Now Bonaparte moved to consolidate his rule. At his urging, the French constitution was again amended. And at 33, Bonaparte became first consul for life, with near dictatorial powers, a king in all but name. The more power that Bonaparte gets, the more he wants. And it escalates step by step never too much at once, always step by step, gradually, and always with Napoleon looking back and saying, remember, I am going to protect the gains of the revolution. They're safe with me. As the 19th century began, Bonaparte set out to prove that he could govern as well as he could fight. A newborn government, he told his secretary, must dazzle and astonish. <laughs> He built new parks, bridges and caves along the Seine, canals, reservoirs, and roads. He would make Paris, he said, the loveliest city that ever was or ever could be. In France, the greatest country on earth launching a series of sweeping political, economic, and legal reforms, he laid the foundation for a new France. All of French society came under his gaze. He set in place a strong, centralized government with a tightly structured, far-reaching bureaucracy, 
organized a new system of state secondary schools, the Lycée, established a central bank, the Bank of France. Slowly, the economy revived, and with it, prosperity. All of Europe was in awe. The great artists and thinkers of the day, Goethe, Hegel, Byron, Beethoven, saw in Bonaparte the embodiment of the ideals and hopes of the revolution. He oversaw the codification of a new system of laws, which abolished feudal privileges and established the equality of every man before the law. Bonaparte's civil code remains the basis of French law to this day. In 1801, Bonaparte signed an agreement with the Pope, the Concordat, making Catholicism the dominant but not exclusive religion of France. He had no personal use for religion, but he understood its political value. If I governed a nation of Jews, he said, I should restore the Temple of Solomon. Religion is excellent stuff for keeping common people quiet. Bonaparte ruled with the carrot and the stick. To reward men of accomplishment, he created a special mark of esteem, the Legion of Honor. My motto has always been, he said, a career open to all talents, without distinctions of birth. He believed in equality. A man should have the chance to rise on the basis of his ability, just as he had done. But he had no patience with those who demanded liberty. He ruled with an iron hand, crushing anyone who dared speak out against him, making a sham of parliament and free elections. I had been nourished by reflecting on liberty, Bonaparte said, but I thrust it aside when it obstructed my path. While Bonaparte ruled France, Josephine gracefully assumed the role of First Lady. But she preferred the quiet seclusion of Malmaison to France's magnificent palaces. In deference to his wife, Bonaparte made Malmaison his countryside seat of government. He worked seven days a week, often 18 hours a day, month after month. But if it could be said that he ever relaxed, it was at Malmaison with Josephine. In 1803, France was still at peace, and Bonaparte was her absolute master. When he looked across his borders, the only country he had to fear was Great Britain. Britain, with the greatest navy in the world. Britain, immensely rich. France and Great Britain had signed a treaty of peace, but no one expected it to last. Even before the treaty was signed, one observer said, peace in a week, war in a month. England, England, always England. There is always a profound antagonism between the sea and the land, between the strength of the continent, represented by Napoleon, and the strength of the sea and international trade, represented by England. It was inevitable that war between France and England would resume. The treaty is a misnomer, it's really a truce. You still have two great powers uh, at odds with each other, fighting for influence, fighting for supremacy, and uh, they've basically fought to a draw at this point. On May 18, 1803, when Great Britain declared war on France, Few were surprised.
the two armies peered at each other across the English Channel, neither willing to risk battle. France held at bay by the British Navy, Britain afraid to send soldiers to fight on the continent. But as Bonaparte waited and readied his troops, his confidence in himself and his star remained unshaken. His victories had already made France larger than it had ever been. He was the most feared man in Europe, and his authority at home remained unchallenged. Thirty-four years old, he was as powerful as any of the Bourbon kings who had come before him. All he lacked was a crown. Now he decided he wanted one. He wished to be a king. His idea is that given what France has achieved in, in the world, it ought to be considered as a kind of empire with Napoleon Bonaparte as the emperor. This would put him on an equal footing with the monarchs of Europe. Uh, he would no longer uh, be an upstart. He would be one of the club. On December 2nd, 1804, the imperial procession made its way through Paris. A Senate proclamation and a vote of the people, both carefully arranged by Bonaparte himself, had given him what he wanted. He was about to become an emperor. As soon as a man becomes a king, he is set apart from all other men, Bonaparte said. I always felt that Alexander the Great's idea of pretending to be descended from a god was inspired by a sure instinct for real politics. In spite of the cold, a half million cheering spectators lined the streets. Bonaparte himself had meticulously planned every detail. The great cathedral, hung with pennants and tapestries and decorated like a Roman temple, seemed more like a theater than a church. But Bonaparte wanted his elevation to glow with the aura of religion. The Pope had been brought from Italy to sanctify the occasion. He has the genius of making the Pope come to Paris, which gives everything a sacred air. It is God who confirms that the changes that took place during the revolution are forever established. Slowly, Bonaparte and Josephine walked toward the two thrones that awaited them. His mantle, adorned with gold and precious jewels and weighing 80 pounds, was supported by his brothers. He looked, one spectator said, like a Caesar on a Roman coin. A little more than 10 years before, the French had beheaded a king. Now. They were crowning an emperor. Born upon the great tide of the French Revolution and the wars that followed in its wake, Bonaparte had turned his genius as a general and a statesman to the domination of France. Soon, he would turn toward the conquest of Europe. Already, he was planning an invasion of Great Britain to make him master of the island nation that dared defy him. Confidently, Bonaparte lifted the imperial crown. And brought it to rest on his own head. Then he moved toward Josephine and crowned her his empress. I am the instrument of providence, Napoleon said. She will use me as long as I accomplish her designs. Then she will break me like a glass.